Welcome to the BEC Bridge. On this episode, we are talking diversity and inclusion. So I have joining me two representatives from the National Disabilities Unit. Kristen Turton, our legal expert, also chats with me on the anti-discrimination legislation. Look out for our segment on Nothing Surprises Me, I Work in HR, and we have the Labor Department telling us about their Health and Safety Week. All of this and more on the BEC Bridge as we build employment connections. This episode of the BEC Bridge podcast was recorded at Coconut Shell Sugar Hill, a breathtaking villa located at the picturesque Sugar Hill Tennis Village, St. James. This property is included in Barbados Sotheby's International Realty's impeccable catalog of villas. On this episode of the BEC Bridge, we are talking diversity and inclusion. Today, I have with me two social workers from the National Disabilities Unit. I have Sharon Codrington Holder and Stevenson Evelyn. Welcome to today's podcast. Thank you so very much for having us. So we will start out by you just telling us what does the Disabilities Unit really do? Tell me. The, the, our, our mission is to facilitate, advocate and promote the empowerment and advancement of persons with disabilities so as to ensure that they are equally given the opportunity to participate in all aspects of national life. All right. That's generally our mission. So that was a mouthful. Break that down for me and tell me what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Tell me about some of the programs that you have going on, etc. Generally, advocacy, that's advocating for and on behalf of persons with disabilities, whether it be at a on behalf of organizations of or for persons with disabilities or individual persons who are living with disabilities who may express a concern of an issue or a mm -hmm. challenge that they're encountering when they interface with the community in general. And once that is made known to us, the officers, we tend to make representation to the issue and advocate for and on their behalf in terms of having it See how best we can rectify the circumstances for which they were complaining of or they have a concern of. Okay. So before we started rolling, we were having a chat and our conversation was about who qualifies as a person with a disability. And you were telling me about, you know, invisible versus visible. So can you share a bit when you talk about your advocating for persons who are living with disabilities? what type of disabilities or what what is your community comprised of the community the community is wide diverse and ever increasing um, mm -hmm. the visible are those things that you can physically see you will see someone walking with a cane or a walker or they may be using a wheelchair to move around or you may just see them walking and they're not walking as what we refer to as a temporarily able-bodied person doing walking without any limps or any shift. The gait is considered normal. The invisible are those that you can't see. You, a person may be suffering with an intellectual challenge, and you would only know that if you engage in conversation with them. The person may be deaf or hard of hearing, and you would only recognize that when you start verbally communicating with them. The person may be blind, and you would only know that if you see them with a cane or the way in which they are going around, moving about, circumspect. Right. As well as then, you may have persons who may have heart conditions. There are some who may be suffering from some kidney disorder or some other internal organ disorder. Those are the disabilities that we come across, and then there are some that is ever increasing. There are certain diseases that predisposes persons to disabling conditions. Oh, such as? HIV AIDS. You may have a person who may have um, a blood disorder. And as it progressively degenerates, then that person, once it is diagnosed, is at a point where the attending physician determines that it is, that, it is a diagnosis of it. And in terms of um, treating, then once the diagnosis is made, that becomes a disabling condition. 
Oh, well, very interesting. You know, when we think about a disabled person, then, you know, the visible is what comes to mind immediately. But thank you for sharing that with us because you, you mentioned temporary able-bodied person, meaning you never know what your state might be in the future. Is that... Well, our, your, our present state, we are presently temporarily able-bodied. Is that because there's a fine line between able and disabled. Heaven forbid, you know, the slightest I may leave here from it, this interview and there may be a pedal on the footpath and a slide next. Lo and behold, I then tomorrow may be diagnosed as a person with a disability. Or I may be a cut in my lawn with a weed whacker and a pebble come up, strike me in the eye. The vision in the eye is lost. I am now blind. So my ailment was temporary up to that point. So I refer to them as that. that okay. All of us are just that fine line between able and disabled. And that's very, very true. I love your examples of showing how, you know, things can change. But I trust that you will leave here today in good health <laughs> with no accidents. That is our <laughs> intention. That, that, that way. Okay, so now you've given us a general overview of what the National Disabilities Unit does and the community that you serve. We're here talking about employment. This is the BC Bridge. We're trying to build employment connections. So in terms of advancing the disabled community and looking for opportunities for them in terms of employment, etc., this is your, your time to share with us what are some of the programs you have ongoing and any tips for employers who may want to engage persons from the disabled community. Sharon, you're taking this one? Yes, thank you so very much for asking that question. At this point in time, we, are, we the National Disabilities Unit, we are developing a skills bank and that skill bank would entail persons with disabilities who have qualifications, whatever their qualifications might be, that we lodge them and log them so that if there's an opportunity for persons to get employment, that we can fit that person with the prospective employer. We also have what we have at the National Disabilities going an entrepreneurial market, oh. which is done yearly, and that also provides a scope for persons with disabilities to to, to allow the public to know that they have skills that, and they have small businesses that persons can utilize, whether they're purchasing products, it could be cottage industries that we have going on for persons as well. So those are two of the initiatives that are presently ongoing at this time. Um, we also have persons, we advocate for persons in order for them to get employment because all of us at some point in time we need assistance so a person with a disability is no different so when when we are looking for employment opportunities for persons then we would be able to connect with those organizations who are interested in partner, partnering with the NDU so that we can allow them to know X has this qualification and we think this will be a good fit not only that it will also allow the prospective employer the opportunity to be to configure to be able to configure their existing infrastructure to allow mm -hmm. that person to come in and to be a part of their organization and it argues well for um, the employer also because once a, you employ a person with a disability that sends a message not only to corporate Barbados but also to persons with disabilities that you know what Sheena works at X let me go there because I know Sheena has a challenge and she understands what I am going through okay. and business can also be provided through that interaction and by having that person employed in your establishment so it is twofold and the employer and the employees will also become sensitized and know how to treat persons with disabilities and they will also gain more knowledge about persons with disabilities. Well, Sharon, you mentioned two words there that um, struck me. You mentioned infrastructure and you mentioned sensitization. 
So tell me, um, so we talked about persons from the disabled community. Sometimes their disabilities are visible, sometimes invisible. And there may be the need for infrastructure support. How does the National Disabilities Unit fit into that picture in terms of infrastructure and assisting businesses who may wish to employ persons from the community? Well, we fit into that picture by when, once the organization does reach out to us and we with them, we will go in and we will see what are the areas that needs to be improved. Whether if you have, a, if the person is blind, there's technology available and we can also give to the employer the recommendations that would be needed to, for that person who's blind to okay. be able to, whether to use Braille and different IT services to enable that person to be a part of the organization. Sensitivity training also would be appropriate because with persons who are blind, as an example, we, will, we able body community will always rush to help them. We see them with the cane, yes, but yet we still want to approach them and hold them incorrectly. That person doesn't need to be held or to, to be led. That person has a cane. All we ask is that if you see a blind person, just let them know you're with them and ask if they need the assistance. If that person doesn't need the assistance, well, that means the person is trying to, is, knows where they're going. And within a work space, just give the person time and the person would learn how to maneuver within that space. I, I think that is very critical. Sometimes we want to help you know, good intentions, yes. but not necessarily having the best outcomes because you're not aware of what the person actually needs. Exactly, and in addition, for, for persons interested in employment with um, persons with a dis employing person with a disability, especially those who are hard deaf and hard of hearing, this opens another opportunity for employers because Sign language is a language I believe every Barbadian, everyone should learn. And it gives you the opportunity to be able to know that person, just to say hello, just to sign hello to a person, to sign good morning, just to let them know that you, are, you understand where they are at and that you will be able to communicate with them going forward. So it is, it's a fantastic language, and I would like more employers to get their staff on board so that they can start learning sign language. All right, so that would speak to the inclusion aspect. Yes. Okay, so as we move towards wrapping up our segment, I want to hear from either of you. Tell me, what are the tips you would give to employers who may want to reach out or who may want to include um, more persons or persons from the disabled community into their workspaces. So we're promoting diversity and inclusion. So if I want to have more persons or someone from the disabled community, what were those tips that you guys would share with employers? Well, it basically is to reach out. Once you reach out, then they'll be able to hear what the issues you, you have or the concerns you have. We will meet, consult, uh, provide any advice or any direction that you may need to make your premises accessible and accessibility is not only physical, it's the technological mm -hmm. and all the other things with it. The training in terms of the staff, what we would do is provide that sensitivity training, what we would implore the organizations to do is identify persons within their organizations who are willing to be that person's, we say, buddy or the person's champion within the organization. Okay. And he or she will be the person to interface with the person with a disability and either the supervisor or the immediate supervisor or the administrator of the organization so that lines won't get blurred or crossed. And that sensitivity training the unit can provide. We are willing, ready, and able to do that with in terms of our programming we are looking now at the deaf empowerment program which is a program where we're looking to have a key service areas like say 
maybe QEH and health for the polyclinics whereby you got video relay where a person who is deaf ah. or hard of hearing interfaces with the polyclinic or the hospital and the reception area or the customer service area would have a video where the individual would be able to speak in sign language. We will have the unit will have um, interpreters on retainer so that the individual who is deaf or hard of hearing will reach out to them and the customer service officer will be able to link up and ask, ask the questions the person speaks with the, who's presenting and requesting the service, the interpreter interprets and the off, customer service officer would respond accordingly and the interpreter would interpret for the person who's right. deaf or hard of hearing, which would make it much more inclusive mm -hmm. that the individual with the disability, him or herself, would want to present and represent themselves in terms of their independence. They want to be independent and that is one of the ways we are seeking to include and provide that degree of independence for persons who are deaf or hard of hearing. Well, that sounds excellent and of course we're promoting diversity and inclusion and therefore it's been wonderful having a chat with you Mr. Evelyn, Mrs. Codrington Holder, thank you so much for joining us for this BEC Bridge podcast. And thank you for the BEC, Barbados Employers Confederation, for thinking of us and including us in this bridge. It is a bridge between the able-bodied and the persons with disabilities. And on behalf of the Ministry of People and Parliament and Elder Affairs and the unit, we thank you for including us into your world. You are We're grateful for that. You are more thank than you. welcome. So that has been our chat with the National Disabilities Unit. This episode is about diversity and inclusion. So as you listen and as you watch, consider how you can be more inclusive in your day-to-day -day activities. Thank you. This is Nothing Surprises Me. I work in HR. Today I have sharing with me, Rebecca Hines, who's a research coordinator with the BEC. So Rebecca, what are you sharing with us today? Tell me your funny stories. Hi Sheena, thanks for having me. So this first story I like to call, Too Busy to Get Fired. We have this employee named John. He was in his boss office and they were discussing a technical issue. Tempers got thrown out of proportion, they got into a screaming match, and John's boss fired him on the spot. He told him to get out, leave the office, you're fired. The boss was leaving for a trip that day, a business trip for a couple days. The next day, John came into the office like normal, like nothing happened. Okay. So obviously all the rest of the employees were looking around like, didn't he get fired yesterday? But John continued to do his work over the next couple of days. So when John's boss comes back and see John at his station, he says to John, didn't I fire you? And John, without holding up his head, calmly says, you can't fire me. I have too much work to do. But <laughs> well, John determined that he was still going to work. Yes. I mean, ideally we know that the boss did not handle the termination in the right way. No. We have legislation that speaks to termination, so we would advise persons to follow the Employment Rights Act if they are going to terminate an employee. But also don't be like John. <laughs> All right, you have any more stories? Yes, one more story, my favorite story. Mm -hmm. um, you know we have this saying, work smarter, not harder. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we have this employee named Bob. Bob works at a tech firm as well. He does a lot of programming. Furthermore, John has the title as the best programmer in the office. So, the tech company that John works, that Bob works for, sorry, mm -hmm decides to do a security, a routine security check, internal routine security check. As they should. Yes. So upon doing the security check, they realize that, you know, someone from China has been logging into their system quite often. Mm -hmm. So immediately they thought, well, we probably have hackers. So they called in an outside security firm to do some further checks and further investigation. Upon investigation, they realize that Bob, the best programmer, had been outsourcing his work to a programming firm in China. <laughs> so Bob 
Upon investigating even further, Bob was doing nothing when the days come. He was basically on eBay, on Reddit, scrolling and getting paid his six figure salary. So Bob thought he had hot to work. <laughs> but he used to say he was fired though. Of course. <laughs> uh, so clearly Bob thought he was smarter than everyone else. But, you know, the takeaway from that would be I, I think managers and employees need to have regular conversations yes. around the work, around what is happening, and any other tidbits you would want to share coming out of Bob's story. Perform regular performance appraisals, checking with your staff, checking with your employees, make sure they're, you know, up to what they're supposed to be doing, they're doing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. You're welcome. Um, both John and Bob have some very interesting stories. Cat luck isn't dog luck, though, so. Yes. So yeah. we always implore persons to follow the rules and regulations of their organizations. Yes follow the Employment Rights Act or other applicable legislation. And if they need advice and support, we're, we're here, here at the BEC to assist. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That has been Nothing Surprises Me. I work in HR. Today on our Spotlight on Employment Law, I have Kristen Turton with me, attorney at law. Kristen, welcome to the BEC Bridge. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Today we're going to talk a bit about a piece of legislation, the Employment Prevention of Discrimination Act. Mm -hmm. So tell me, in your interactions, what do you think is a common misconception about this piece of legislation? I think the most common one is that it imposes undue hardship on employers. It requires mm -hmm. them to take too many steps, consider too many things, and make too many adjustments to accommodate persons who fall into the categories that the legislation is protecting. And while it does require adjustments to be made, it's not undue. In fact, the legislation expressly gives employers a defense where to make those adjustments or to hire persons in those categories would cause undue hardship. Okay, so the legislation does account for if something is too burdensome on employers. It does. It, it tries to strike a middle, a middle ground, a mm -hmm. balance, really, between making sure that people are not excluded from employment or prevented from carrying out their roles just because of characteristics like age or sex or sexual orientation, um, marriage status and so on, even disability, and trying to make sure that employers still have a business that can operate right. in the end. The employer is not required to change his business or his business model or his business location to accommodate persons in those categories, but they're required to make reasonable adjustments to ensure that if those persons are capable of performing the job that's required, that they're able to do so. Okay, so we know that in this piece of legislation, we have a list of protected characteristics, but then there's also the concept of a genuine occupational qualification, mm -hmm. where um, employers, if, if it's a genuine occupational qualification, they can have this type of restriction included in their hiring practices. Can mm -hmm. you explain that a bit for our audience? There are just simply some jobs that would need to be done by certain categories of persons. And with that in mind, the legislation has created this exception. So you would have, for example, if you have a, bu a business that is running a women's shelter for battered women or victim victims of rape, for example, you would find that they would prefer to hire a female or female counselors to limit the negative impact on the people who they're serving. That would be considered a genuine occupational requirement. Um, you have issues of age as well. So because of certain jobs like driving buses and so on or being a pilot, um, there is a genuine occupational requirement that the persons doing those jobs not be over a certain age. Okay. Um, those are the types of examples that you might find where that characteristic is necessary or that restriction is necessary so that the job can be performed properly. Okay, so just before we wrap up, are there any tips that you want to leave with employers on best practice when it comes to ensuring 
that they don't run afoul of the legislation? I think we have to remember that the legislation covers not only people who work with you presently, but also people who you are hiring. So it starts from the hiring process, from that first advertisement. It's important to make sure the advertisement is neutral, that it does not identify any of those uh, protected characteristics, unless they are genuine occupational requirements, and that as you go through the process, that you properly document the decisions that you are making and why. So that if a question is raised about any form of discrimination, you can point to this document that says, well, when I went through this hiring process, these are the neutral factors that I took into consideration in hiring the person for the job that I wanted them to do. Thank you so much, Kristen. That has been our spotlight on employment law as we explored our anti-discrimination legislation. On the BEC Bridge, we always try to keep you in the know. Today I have with me Carrie Ann Branford, Senior Safety and Health Officer with the Labor Department. And Carrie Ann, you're going to tell us all about Health and Safety Week. Hi hey, Sheena, thank you for having me here today. Um, Safety and Health Week, Occupational Safety and Health Week, is a biennial event that's held by the Labor Department. So every two years we have a series of seminars um, where we invite the public, free of charge, to come and get some information from all of the different stakeholders that we might work with mm -hmm. in terms of occupational safety and health to see how they can improve their work environment. All right, so what do you have happening in your Occupational Health and Safety Week? This year, Occupational Safety and Health Week will be held during the week of June 25th to 30th, 2023. And we're gonna start off with a church service on the Sunday at St. Peter's Parish Church. And then after that, the seminars will be held from Monday to Thursday at Aqua Beach Hotel and Spa. And those will be starting around nine o'clock each day. But in order to get in on these sessions, you would have to register beforehand. All right, so I know about the week and the BC would normally share your information on what's happening. So the BC, of course, will share your registration information, but for other persons, where else can they go to get information on the week, the different sessions, and how to register? Okay, well, registration will be available on our website and on our social media pages. That's the Ministry of Labor, Social Security, and Third Sectors website. And our social media pages, you will find it also on GIS. And the other stakeholders that we would work with on a day-to-day -day basis, they will also be sharing that information. Um, so persons can feel free to register by either going and using that online link or calling us directly in the office to register. Okay, so tell us, what are some of the sessions you have planned for the week? Okay, so during the week, our main focus is going to be on the regulations to the Safety and Health at Work Act that you right. might have heard um, were recently made and gazetted. So we have those available, 10 regulations and one order. That's the prime feature this year. And then outside of those regulations, we will have sessions on topics such as um, indoor air quality, facilities management, and the challenges and solutions that both facilities managers and occupiers might have in buildings, um, predominantly in, in the terms of indoor air quality. Right. We will also have sessions on practical tips for ergonomics to help make your workspace more comfortable and we will have sessions on working safely at heights and depths. We also have a special section on safety committees and that will be geared mainly towards persons in the education sector, but of course anyone with a safety committee or looking to set up your safety committee can register for that day, that session, and join us for that information. Well, that sounds like you have a lot going on in that week and you're touching on a lot of areas that would be important for employers and for persons to have their knowledge base increased to make sure that we have health and safe, healthy and safe workers yes. within our workplaces. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, one last thing before we mm -hmm. sign off, during Health and Safety Week, we were discussing the fact that you know, safety and health at work is now a fundamental principle, a fundamental right at work. And you wanted employers to organize some type of activity to highlight health, um, healthy living or safe work practices within the week. So 
this is your time. Go ahead, yes. encourage person. So you just touched on the theme for Safety and Health Week, which is safety and health, a fundamental principle and right at work. And one of the things that we're encouraging employers across the island to do during that week to help us celebrate and commemorate Occupational Safety and Health Week would be to have activities in your work environment on any, any day that you choose. It could be a, a, a small activity, it doesn't have to be anything that's grand, something as simple as having stretch breaks. Um, during the day, encouraging persons to get up from their workstations and move around um, to help us celebrate Safety and Health Week and, and show, you know, that there are practical things that can be done in the work environment to help promote safety and health. All right. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann. Thank you for having me, Sheena. Yes. So, employers, you've heard that. If you want to sign up for Health and Safety Week and for the free sessions being put on by the Labor Department, you can look at the BC's website or the Ministry of Labor's website for further information. And you can start planning what you want to do to increase in awareness about healthy living and safe work practices during Health and Safety Week 2023. This brings our first season of the BEC Bridge to a close. However, we'll be back. Look out for us on the first Sunday of every month, coming back to you in September, as we continue to build employment connections via the BEC Bridge.